Good morning, everyone. This is the Sunday School Hour for Victory Baptist Church on this Sunday, May the 17th, 2020. It is currently 9.56 a.m. Central Time. I've started a little early. I always try to to give everyone the chance to hit that big, to hit the, the, the I, I don't know, what does it look like? You you tap on this program to listen to me live. It takes a minute for them to, to for everyone to get the notification, uh, you know, uh, tap on the screen and then catch up to where I am. So I go live, give it a few minutes for everyone to, uh, to catch up. So um, hopefully people are doing that. Hopefully everyone is having a great day. I have already done two broadcasts this morning. I uh, did a broadcast for the VBC Bible Institute and the um, we're in our course on a journey through the Bible. We're still in the book of Genesis for the VBC Bible Institute. We uh, today was part five in Genesis chapter one, and I I, I spent I, I'm spending a lot of time in Genesis chapter one in our journey through the Bible because one of the things Genesis one. One of the things Genesis 1 does for us is not only does it offer the origins of creation, not, not only, but it offers us the origin really of biblical difficulties. Because as soon as you get into Genesis 1, you realize that Genesis 1 is a source of all kinds of disputes and disagreements and arguments and debates and a multitude of interpretations. So for the VBC Bible Institute and our course on Genesis, I'm using Genesis 1 to introduce us to well, how to deal with biblical problems. And the one big one that I've been working on is the gap theory. And uh, in my last, uh, my last session uh, um, for our course on, well, for our course through Journey Through the Bible, but the book of Genesis specifically, um, I started talking about the gap theory and I asked uh, listeners to send me a screenshot of the Schofield Reference Bible since I don't know where my Schofield Reference Bible has gone. Uh, it's, it's, it's gone somewhere. Uh, but uh, uh, Miss Gussler sent me a, a screenshot of her Schofield Reference Bible. So this morning for the VBC Bible Institute, I went live for about an hour and I tore apart the Schofield Reference Bible note on and, and its promotion of the gap theory. So I did that. And then uh, just a few minutes ago, I was live on the air on under the Theology Central podcast. And in fact, hopefully, I hope I didn't make a mistake. Give me a second. I have to look. I have to look. I think I made a mistake. Let me look. I know I did. I know I did. Let me look here. No, no. Okay, we're live under the VBC podcast. I was almost positive I did not change it, and we were live under the Theology Central podcast. So, good. We're in the right place. So, everyone should be in the right place. So, we're live under the v- VBC podcast. That is great. Okay. Now, and uh, yes, so everything is good to go. So, um. So uh, under the Theology Central podcast this morning, I went live and I uh, I played a news clip dealing with, uh, well, some commencement speeches that are being given this time of year. And, uh, well, I, I, I was very negative in regards to the whole subject. So young people, all right, uh, those who are younger, right, college students, I won't name certain ones like Emma. Mary and Elizabeth. Okay, the I would love the young people to listen to that uh, podcast episode and give me their thoughts uh, because it it was all about young people and I'm trying to I'm trying to env- envision what it would be like right now to be in college or to be a high school senior when the whole world has been turned upside down. It's got to be crazy. So when I was listening to all the commencement speeches that are happening right now virtually, um, I I just. I, I started yelling that they're dumb and they're foolish and uh, they're, I, they, they irritated me. But uh, everyone, uh, younger people may have a different perspective, so uh, their feedback would be appreciated uh, on that. So we'll see because, you know, I tend to be – I tend to be – you know, Mr. Positive, but every once in a while, I can be very negative and cynical. I know it's rare that it happens, but yeah, so it'll be interesting to get uh, feedback on that. So, all right, hopefully everyone is ready to go now, right? It's, that's called uh, killing time, okay? That, that's called just just talking to talk, all right? But from this point forward, now I have a specific purpose in mind, and hopefully everyone is going to be ready to go. So, Here is the thing. For all the members of Victory Baptist Church, for all the members of Victory Baptist Church, 
You need to pay close attention to what I'm about to say. The first thing we need to get out of the way is we will be having church, real church, you know, like everyone being here Sunday, you see, May the 31st. Yeah, Sunday, May the 31st. That is when we will be having church again. Sunday, May the 31st. That is when, well, hopefully you will be here. Now, as soon as I say that, I get a notification. (laughs) Literally, as I'm talking, I get a notification on my iPad. There were 1,587 new coronavirus cases in Texas yesterday. So yesterday, there was 1,587 new coronavirus cases in Texas. So as of right now, though, May the 31st is when we're going to... we're going to try, we're going to shoot for having um, actual real church service with people, you know, actually walking through the front door and sitting in the pews. Um, we will obviously try to take, you know, all the precautions that we can and everyone try to, you know, we'll, we'll try to, you know, use social distancing, hand sanitizer and all of that. And we will see. Um, but at some point we have to try to get back to to church and we'll just wait and see. I I I haven't heard yet if churches in the local area have made any decisions. I don't know. Some may wait to the beginning of June, but we're going to we're going to go for that for May for May the 31st. So please uh, write that down if all possible. If you you know, be here. Obviously, if you're sick, don't be here. If you have any symptoms of any kind of anything, don't be here. So we'll ne- need to take those precautions and we'll see how it works, but obviously that is subject to change. You know, over a thousand new cases in Texas yesterday. We'll have to continue to monitor the situation. I'm now getting all these notifications about coronavirus in Texas. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, so we will uh, we'll have to monitor it, and we'll make the best decision possible. And uh, if you know, at any time, if we need to stop meeting again and go back to doing it this way, we will. I know it's crazy. Um, some of you may now like it. Some of you may hate it. I don't know what uh, people's feelings are. I know that I'm I'm ready to have church. <laughs> I'd, I, I'm ready to have church as uh, well a, in a normal way. That's as normal as possible. But we uh, we'll have to wait and see. We'll see if uh, things as we move through the summer, we get back to the fall. There's a lot of predictions that it's, the coronavirus will come back with you know a vengeance, and everything's going to get shut down again. We don't know. We put it this way: we don't don't know what the future holds. We're going to take it. One, we'll take it one Sunday at the time at a time, one Wednesday night at a time. We'll try to make the absolute best decisions. But we definitely. I mean, I think we can all agree: this, the church we're supposed to be here, and so we need to get back uh, here as much as possible. And hopefully, I know you're going to be. I kind of see church attendance sometimes as a discipline. And once you get out of doing it, then you lose that discipline. And then, you know, church uh, church attendance numbers could be all over the place and be really bad. And people can just say, well, you know, I spent six weeks listening at home. Why go back? Um, hopefully uh, we can avoid <laughs> some of those wrong ways of thinking. Uh, so it will it'll be we'll see. So I'll keep you uh, up to date. Um, and if anything changes, I'll let you know and uh, we'll move forward, all right? If you hear about what other churches are doing, please let me know. Okay, now, with all of that said, all of that, if you, th- I want you to really think about this. Uh, because we're gonna go, I- I'll, I'll, I'll set it up this way. Because we're gonna go back to church as normal on May the 31st, that's the plan. Then I thought, well, since we've been doing this live streaming thing, that's clearly not church as normal. And it does give us the opportunity to do things a little different. So we're going to use this hour and the next hour to do something very different than typically we would do for church. And then hopefully this evening, we'll kind of go back to Romans 5, possibly. We may do something else. We'll see. Um, But we're going to change things up today. But I hope, I hope the change you'll find interesting and hopefully you'll find uh, very beneficial. But you're going to have to put your thinking caps on because this is going to be a situation where I may not give you the answer. I may provide you the question and you're going to thank me for giving you questions and not answers because I know y'all love when I do that. I know you do. I know it's your favorite thing. I I think every Sunday you wake up going, I hope he gives me some questions and gives me no answers today. I really hope he does that. And when I give you the answer, you're like, oh, man. 
Don't give me the answer. I like to be confused and I like to not know what to think. And I like to know what I like to f- have that feeling of I don't know what to believe anymore. I can't believe you robbed me of that wonderful opportunity. Yeah, I, yeah, I know none of you say that, but hey, questions are good. All right. So I'm going to provide provide you some questions this morning, some difficulties, and I'm, I'm going to really, really challenge you to think about it. Now, these are the situations where you can listen, not bother to take the challenge to think, and then therefore this has no actual long lasting uh, value. But I'm going to hope you will, because listen, whether you know it or not, I want you to listen to me, whether you know it or not, you have a theology and a belief about what we're going to be discussing. And you articulate that in a lot of different ways, whether you realize it or not. And I'm going to argue that at times you may even fluctuate between two contradictory principles at the same time and not even realize that you're holding two contradictory concepts at the same time. And so we're, I'm going to really challenge you on this, challenge me on this. And I, and this is, this literally goes down to the very idea. And, and here's, here's going to be the question we're going to work on. All right. How should the church operate? Or let me put it a different way. What should be the guiding principle for the church? And I'm going to expand that. What should be the guiding principle in how you live your life as a Christian? What should be the guiding principle and how the church operates? And, and currently you're witnessing this problem being played out in the news. There are churches out there going, no, we have, we cannot close down. We don't care if there's a pandemic. We don't care if 30 million people died yesterday. We have to meet. We have to. It's a biblical command. Others are like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we don't have to meet that way in, in, in a time of great crisis and a time of an emergency like a pandemic. But some believe it's a biblical mandate. Others believe it's not a biblical mandate because they are, they are, these are different. You are witnessing the playing out of different philosophies about how church should occur based off what the guiding principle they're utilizing is to make that determination. So you have a guiding principle about how church should operate. You have a guiding principle about uh about your attendance in church. You have a guiding principle about how you should live your Christian Christian life. The, the key is, can you articulate what that guiding principle is? So here's what we're going to do. Let's begin with a definition this morning, right? Now, this is going to be radically different than normal. Just stay with me, all right? Stay with me. Here we go. Thinking caps on. Everybody's thinking caps on. You're sitting at your house, Get that cup of coffee. I don't know why any human being would drink coffee, but get that cup of coffee. You know, or Dr. Pepper. You know, you could do a Red Bull. You could do that energy drink, five-hour energy, whatever you need. Okay, get that so that you're ready to think. Okay, are you ready? Everybody got your coffee ready to go. All right, let's start with some definitions. You ready? Here we go. Let's give. Let's get a definition for guiding principles. When I use the term guiding principle or guiding principles, and we're going to be focusing on a guiding principle singular, but so we're going to, we're going to look at the definition for guiding principles or a guiding principle. Okay. Everybody got that? Guiding principle. Are you ready? Here's some definitions. Number one, guiding principles. This is using the plural, but we're going to be focusing on one guiding principle. Uh, that's that's what we're going to be doing. But all the definitions refers to it as guiding principles. But that's okay. All right, here we go. Any principles or precepts that guide an organization throughout its life in all circumstances, irrespective of changes in its goals, strategies, type of work, or the top management. Right, so a guiding principle or guiding principles are any principles or precepts that guide an organization throughout its life in all circumstances, irrespective of changes in its goals, strategies, type of work, or the top management. 
I'm going to read that one more time. Guiding principles, any principles or precepts that guide an organization throughout its life and all circumstances, irrespective of changes in its goals, strategies, type of work, or the top management. So a guiding principle is, if we're talking about the church, the guiding principle would be that thing that guides the church throughout its life. No matter what else changes, no matter what other circumstances occur, even if the top management, the pastor, it changes. The, 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 the pastor could die, the pastor could, could quit, the, whatever could happen to the pastor. Nothing, that doesn't change the, 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 the guiding principle that is guiding that church throughout its life. Now, I will argue most churches do not have a guiding principle because they change typically when the pastor comes in or depending which majority gets control of the church and fight and fight and argue and then changes it. The guiding principle changes because I will argue some churches couldn't even identify what the guiding principle is. Now, I know what some of you say, well, the guiding principle is the Bible. Okay, what does that, okay, all right, that, that's, not, that's not a good answer, all right, because that doesn't really mean anything. There, you can have a church, you'll say the guiding principle, listen, you can have a church that'll say, hey, the guiding principle is the Bible, right? And then they'll have a worship service where someone, you know, the pastor zip lines, in, you know, across the sanctuary to the pulpit, and then they, they have a drama, and they have a skit, and then they have a, a you know, a, a fall festival, and they do all, the, all these kinds of things, right? And you're like, wait a minute. I thought you said the Bible was your, was your guiding principle. And you'll have another church who will say, all of that is wrong. All of that is sinful. And they'll say the Bible is their guiding principle. So just saying, the, no, we've got to be more specific. But just make sure you understand. A guiding principle gu- guides the organization, irrespective of change, ir- ir- irrespective of circumstances. It doesn't even matter if the top management is gone. Here is the guiding principle that we stick with. Now, what is the guiding principle for our church? What is the guiding principle in your Christian life? I want to expand it to both the church and the Christian life, right? So there's one definition. Let's go to another, right? Guiding principles are a broad philosophy that encompasses your personal beliefs and values and guide and guide an organization throughout its life in all circumstances, irrespective of changes in its goals, strategies, or type of work. They create a company culture where everyone understands what's important. All right, so this is very similar to the first definition, but uh, they, they describe guiding principles as a broad philosophy that encompasses your personal beliefs and values and guide an organization throughout its life in all circumstances, irrespective of change in its goals, strategies, or type of work. They create a company culture where everyone understands what's important. A guiding principle, a guiding principle. Okay, now, are you ready? So everyone got that down? All right. If for some reason you need me to repeat, uh, in fact, this is what I'll do. I'm going to copy these really quick. Again, we're, we can do things differently, all right? When we get back to church as normal, we won't be able to do these types of things. Now, we can do these things in a live broadcast if everyone's there, okay? All right, here we go. I'm going to put the definitions in the chat four guiding principles, all right? Okay, and thanks for those who are giving me information about churches starting, and uh, I'm glad Seth has got his thinking cap on. That's good. All right, very good. That's that's good to go. All right. Seth has got his thinking cap on. That's that's good. M- maybe for the first time. No, I'm just joking. All right. All right, here we go. All right, so I sent everyone the definition if you need it. There is the definition of guiding principles. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down two words. Two words. Are you ready? All right, here we go. I want you to write down the word, and I'll spell it out. R-E-G-U-L-A-T-I-V-E. R-E-G-U-L-A-T-I-V-E. 
regulative, right? Regulative, right? R-E-G-U-L-A-T-I-V-E. The reg- reg- regulative principle is sometimes what this is referred to. The regulative principle, right? So write down regulative, R-E-G-U-L-A-T-I-V-E, or you could even write down the phrase regulative principle, the regulative principle, right? And then next thing I want you to write down, normative, normative, the normative principle, the regulative principle or the normative principle, the regulative principle or the normative principle, regulative or normative, regulative or normative. If I get another notification about the coronavirus in Texas, I'm going to throw my iPad, all right? Regulative principle or normative principle. I want you to write those two phrases down, all right? Now, here is the key. The regulative principle or the normative principle, that is the principle that churches They either use the regulative principle or the normative principle. And in your Christian life, you either use the regulative principle or the normative principle. Even if you don't know what these things are, you are utilizing one of them. But what usually happens is we use, we we have the regulative principle and the normative principle, which are very different. And what we have done, most churches, they have some weird hybrid of something in between the regulative, regulative and the normative. But here's what's weird. Sometimes they will speak like the regulative principle is what they adhere to. But then in practice, they'll, they'll, they'll act like they hold to the normative principle. Or they'll say the normative principle is their principle, and then at times act like they're the regulative principle. Regulative principle is the principle that is guiding them. Now remember, these are regulative and normative principle is the guiding principle for a church or for a Christian. They, that's the thing that's supposed to guide us, irrespective of circumstance. It doesn't matter changes. doesn't matter what happens. Either you, you agree with the regulative principle or you agree with the normative principle. And many church splits happen because you'll have groups of people in the church and they're arguing and what someone should do is say, stop, stop, time out. All right, group number one who's making their argument, right? Regulative or normative principle. Group two, regulative and normative principle. If neither group can identify if they hold to the regulative or normative principle, then what you should do is say, stop fighting and go figure out which one you are going. We've got to come up with which principle is guiding us. If it's not the regulative, if it's not the normative, (laughs) then we've got to figure that out or we can't move forward. All right, this is very, very important. Regulative or normative? Now, I, I would, I, I'm afraid to ask. It would be interesting to know if I ask the members of Victory Baptist Church, hey, do we hold to the regulative or the normative? Which one do we hold to? Which one do we hold to? Now, some of you are Googling regulative principle and normative principle right now, and I will say, shame on you, okay? Shame on you. How dare you try to look up the answer while well, I'm going to try to just give you questions. I don't want you to have the answers right now, okay? Regulative principle, normative principle. That's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the regulative principle and the normative principle, and we're going to be doing this in a unique way, all right? I have an episode of the podcast known as, I think it's called uh, Raw Theology or Theology in the Raw. I don't know what, I don't remember the direct title. And on a recent episode of this podcast, they spoke to a church planner, someone who plants churches and he helps churches. And as soon as they started talking, they were kind of, one of the reasons they were doing this is kind of trying to determine what is church going to look like after the COVID-19 situation finally comes to an end? Is church going to be different? Is church going to change? And as soon as they started talking about church, the changing of the church, I was like, wait a minute. So are they holding to the regulative principle or the normative principle, right? Now, if you start talking about church changing, can a church change and still hold to the regulative principle? And if the church can change, how much can it change? What's going to come down to which one you hold to? 
the regulative principle or the normative principle. So we're going to listen to this episode and I'm going to, you know, interrupt and offer my analysis, but we're going to be really focusing on this question of regulative and normative. Now, what we may do is we may spend, we may, this may take up our entire Sunday. This may take up our entire Sunday because, um, Trying to set this up is going to take longer than a thought. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to work through what the regulative principle is and the normative principle is, and I'm going to make sure that everyone understands it because while we're listening to this episode of this podcast, if you don't know the regulative principle and the normative principle, then your interpretation of the podcast would be like part of me wanted to play the podcast without any comment, and then ask questions. And then once you gave me all the wrong answers, go, hello, are you, do you hold to the regulative principle or the normative principle? How, why are you not utilizing that to interpret the podcast? But that, that, that would, that would, I would have to do that. You know, I don't, I don't think that would really, it would be great to pull that off, but it would be weird doing it uh, that way. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to work on the regulative and the normative. I'm going to make sure you understand these principles and then, um, then, then we'll we'll start listening to the podcast. I don't know; it may take a little bit longer than I thought. Oh, well, it always does. But I, I, I hopefully this is beneficial. And 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 this is important for all the older people who, who you attend this church. If you ever leave this church, um, I mean, who knows? By the time I'm done, you may all decided to leave. But uh, or you may never decided after COVID nineteen to never come back. Um, if that's you then uh, whatever church you look for in the future, you need to determine, does that church hold to the regulative or normative principle? Any, uh, to, you know, in, anyone listening who are even not members of this church, does, you, does your church hold to the regulative or normative principle? If you're out looking for a church, do you, do you even care if they hold to the regulative or normative principle? You, I, I, trust me, in your mind, at times you're on the regulative t- side and sometimes you're on the normative side, all right? So here we go. Let's, let's work through this, all right? Regulative or normative principle of worship, all right? Which viewpoint is correct? Which viewpoint is correct? Now, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to answer that question. I pose the question, hey, which viewpoint is correct? When it comes to the church, regulative or normative, which one is right? When it comes to your life, regulative or normative, which one is right? I'm going to pose the question more than I'm going to try to answer it because I'm going to just try to show you some of the difficulties with it, all right? So let's let's put our thinking caps on and let's see what we can find. All right, here we go. The regulative principle of worship maintains that Scripture gives specific guidelines for conducting corporate worship services and that churches must not add anything to those guidelines. All right, let me read this again. The regulative principle of worship maintains that scripture gives specific guidelines for conducting corporate worship services and that churches must not add anything anything to those guidelines. All right. Another way to put the regular principle, the church can only do what is specifically outlined and commanded in scripture. You can only do what is specifically spoken of, specifically commanded. That is all you can do. You can't do anything else. You cannot deviate. It regulates exactly what you can do. It says, do this. This is what you have to do. All right. Now, this same principle can come over to your life. Your life is regulated by what the scripture specifically says you can do. Now, some of you may say, amen, I like the regulative principle. Oh, be careful. Be careful. You'll see in a minute. All right. So just make sure we get the regulative principle down. It's regulating, right? And please note how it's regulating. The regulative principle of worship maintains that scripture gives specific guidelines for conducting corporate worship services and that churches must not add anything to those guidelines. You can only do what is specifically commanded and instructed to do. You can only do in your life what is specifically 
told that you can do in your life. You cannot do anything else. For example, churches following the regulative principle and worship often do not use musical instruments. Since there is no New Testament command or example that would warrant their use in the church. That's a regulative principle. You'll see that in the Church of Christ. Church of Christ. Many Church of Christ churches are very regulative in their their, their philosophy. Hey, no, 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 no. You cannot have uh, musical instruments. The New Testament does not say so. In fact, all churches should be the church of Christ because there's there's nothing in the Bible that says Victory Baptist Church. That name, in other words, our name, we're violating the regulative principle because there are no Baptist churches out. In other words, the name, all we can say is they're the churches of Christ. So we would have to just be the church of Christ because that's that they would argue that's part of the regulative principle. Some would argue regulative principle does not allow for a fellowship mill in the church. Because in the New Testament, when they offer, when they added a mill to the worship service, the agape feast, we talk, in First Corinthians, Paul told them to go home and eat. The regulative principle says you can't do that. The regulative principle says, hey, the church nowhere in the New Testament calls for fun, food, and fellowship and activities. It doesn't call for any of that. The regulative principle says, no, the church has a specific mission. That's what you do. You don't add anything to it. That's the regulative principle. So in your Christian life, what can you do? You can only do what you're instructed to do. That's your life. Can't You can't just add to anything you want. The, the, the scriptures regulates it to some level. All right? And my, my daughter uh, in Boston seems to think that I'm not at church right now. Uh, she wants to text me while I'm, you know, at church. Okay, so someone, uh, hey, uh, Stacy, could you uh, contact our youngest daughter and tell her that, you know, hey, we're in church. Okay, all right, there we go. Someone needs to regulate my daughter, okay? She needs the regulative principle, all right? Here we go, all right? So let me read this again. The regulative principle of worship maintains that scripture gives specific guidelines for conducting corporate worship uh, services and that churches must not add anything, anything to those guidelines. For example, churches following the regulative principle and worship often do not use musical instruments since there is no New Testament command or example that would warrant their use in the church. Now, some will argue, wait a minute, um, they may try to run to the Psalms, right? And But they would say, wait a minute, that's Old Testament, not New Testament. Some may try to pull some things from Revelation. Does that work? Does that not work? Uh, we, that gets into a whole whole a whole other set of issues that we won't get into right now. So there's the regulative principle. Let me make it very clear. The regulative principle says you can only do what is specifically commanded and specifically outlined. Can't do anything else. The normative principle is the idea that anything not expressly expressly forbidden by scripture can be used in corporate worship. All right, so this is the argument. You can do anything that is not expressive. I mean, it has to be expressly condemned. You can do anything that's not just absolutely clearly condemned or clearly prohibited. If it's not clearly prohibited, if it's not clearly condemned, you can do it. You can just, you can do whatever you want up to that point. Right? One says you can only do that which is expressly commanded. The other one says you can do anything unless it's expressly condemned. Right? So one, you can only do that which is commanded, that which is clearly outlined, that which is clearly you have an example of. The other one says, no, I can do anything I want all the way up to something being clearly and absolutely clearly condemned. All right, you'll see this uh, alcohol. This is where a lot of people, you know, um, uh, a lot of people are very like, I can do anything I want. I can drink as much as I want until I reach that express, the express, the very thing that's clearly expressed, and that is drunkenness. So I can do anything I want. Others will say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
The Bible regulates a lot of things. It warns you about alcohol over and over and over and over. It warns you, don't be deceived. You know, wine is a mocker. Don't be deceived. Strong drink this. And it gives the warnings and Proverbs. It gives you examples of people getting drunk. And anytime someone gets drunk, bad things happen. Okay. It gives you all these warnings about alcohol. And then we know we could take from all of the, the, the information that we get in, in, in scripture and, and from just, you know, st- science and the world and the medical world of all the dangers of addiction. Uh, okay. I think I'm going to regulate, uh, I, you know, I'm not clearly commanded to go, uh, go out and drink. I'm not cl- clearly commanded to do so. And I've got warnings against it. Okay. I'm going to regulate it. Others will say, no, 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 no. The only thing that's expressly condemned is drunkenness. So I can drink. In fact, we could have a drinking party in the church. We could get, we could get all the men together on a Friday night and say, Hey guys, meet at church and we're going to do a, a beer tasting. We're going to do a, a beer tasting because I mean, it's not condemned in scripture. It's not condemned. As long as we don't get drunk, we're okay. So, you, and a lot of you live your Christian, we all live our Christian life either leaning towards the regulative principle or we, or we live our Christian life leaning to the normative principle. And churches do the same thing. What is the guiding principle? What is your guiding principle? What is the guiding principle? All right. So let me read the normative principle again. All right. The normative principle is the idea. Let me find it again. The normative principle is the idea that anything not expressly forbidden by Scripture can be used in corporate worship. One of the foundational differences is that the former considers the Bible's instructions as a strict code of conduct, while the latter sees them as a principle to follow. Both hold to the truth of God's Word, but they differ on whether or not it clearly establishes an unalterable blueprint for corporate worship. All right? So the regulative and the normative. Please note that again. One of the foundational differences is that the former considers the Bible's instructions as a strict code of conduct. Here, the Bible is giving you instructions. This is a strict code of conduct. While the latter, the normative, they see the, they're just as principles to follow. These are just giving us principles. They're just giving us prints. They're just giving us guidelines. But we can do anything we want within these guidelines as long as we don't go with what is clearly condemned. All right. Now, both sides, the regulative side and the normative side, will tell you the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is the final authority. They will both hold it up. All right. Both will claim to be Bible believers. But you're like, wait, how how can that church look so radically different than that church? And they have completely different philosophy about what should or shouldn't happen in church. Well, guess what? Because one is holding to a regulative principle and one is holding to a normative principle. Now, here's the question. You ready? The regulative principle and the normative principle, listen, are philosophies, ideologies, theological presuppositions that people place on the text. Because does the Bible tell you, hey, use the regulative principle? Does the Bible say, use the normative principle? Does it? You don't even see the term regulative and normative there. So in other words, if I read the New Testament and I go from Matthew to Revelation, when I'm done, does the Bible say, hey, here's the principle that should guide you? Here's the principle. Here's what you can do or can't do. You can do, you can only do that which is expressly commanded, which you have an example of. You can, that's all you can do. Or can you do anything you want until you find that which is expressly condemned and prohibited? How do you govern it? And again, we, we fluctuate between these. But I will argue these are ideas that we've placed upon the Bible, and then this becomes the way we operate. And so then you'll have people, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, you can't do that. Like, no, 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 the Bible doesn't expressly condemn that. And you'll say, but wait a minute, the Bible doesn't tell you you can do that. Well, I can do anything unless it condemns it. And like, no, 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 you can only do what the Bible tells you to do. Okay, well, how, which, which is the right way? Which is the right way? Now, whether you like it or not, you fluctuate between these two principles all the time, all the time. And that's why there's so much disagreement within the Christian life, regulative, or normative, regulative or normative. 
you've got you've got to really be thinking about these. All right. Now, the regulative principle is most often associated with. Are you ready? The regulative principle is most often associated with reformed churches, while the normative principle is widely promoted by modern day evangelicalism. That's why if you walk into a reformed church, radically different than an evangelical church. You walk into Beltway and Abilene or New Hope or many of the churches in Abilene, and you're like, wait, what's going on? Normative principle is what's going on, right? Normative principle. You walk into our church, we're definitely much more, I mean, we're, we're obviously reformed and, uh, you know, we use the London Baptist Confession, so we're definitely far more reformed than, than you know, most other churches. And you can, you see the, you see the, um, the remnants of, you see the influence of the regulative principle. I, I don't say, I don't even know if we're, we, we, I don't know if anyone actually holds true to the regulative principle, but we're definitely more influenced by the regulative principle regulative principle. That's definitely much more, the regulative principle has been much more influential on my life than the normative principle. The normative principle, I'm like, what is going on? But but if you try to, if you condemn what the normative churches are doing, they look at you like, what's wrong with you? You you just, you're so close-minded and, and judgmental and, and you're like, well, because I think your normative principle is whacked. Okay, that's that's the problem here. But you get, you're speaking different languages. They're speaking the language of the normative principle. You're speaking the language of the regulative principle. And you look like, you know, an alien that just dropped from outer space. But you look at what's going on in those churches and you're like, uh, what, wait, what, what, what's going on? Y'all doing, wait, what happened? Wait, that, and you don't see a problem with that? And you're looking at them like they're an alien that just dropped from outer space. There's, there's your issue. Regulative and normative is the issue, all right? Now, typically liturgical churches, such as Catholic, and the Catholic Church, Episcopalian, and Orthodox, may appear to follow the regulative principle, but they also include many elements not found in the Scripture. Now, this is where it becomes weird. Like some of the, the more liturgical ones they 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 they're very strict, right? You can only do this, so they appear to be regulative. But the problem is, well, wait a minute. You you're very strict, and they want to allow a lot of the craziness that's going on in the evangelical world. In the evangelical world, it's like, whoa, what kind of craziness is going on here, right? So you're like, man, that liturgical. I'm going to run to the liturgical because, whoo, at least there's some kind of you know, there's some you know, there's something that looks like they're sane. But wait a minute. Are they adding things that the scripture don't, they don't tell us to do? Like, where did that liturgy come from? Well, what you'll discover is many of those liturgy, the liturgies they're following don't come from scripture. They came from church history and tradition. Well, that's not the regulative principle. That's the normative. Well, we can use these liturgies and we can use this structure because the Bible doesn't condemn it. Yeah, but does the Bible instruct it? Does the Bible command it? Does the Bible teach it? So there you can you can have something that is as whacked out as you know what can happen in many of the crazy churches and 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 you know I can I can you know show you some of the things going on in churches. Um you can be like I'll I'll give you an example. Here's from the I'll give you from the news. Where is it? I've got the news article right here. I saw it the other day. Let me see if I can find it. I think I saved it. I was going to do a uh Yeah, here it is. Hillsong. Hillsong depicts one of the three wise men as a woman. All right. And they have a picture of them on stage. They're doing some kind of big play. I don't know, some kind of, you know, one of those. And right there, even, even when you have one of these big productions, right? When you have a church will do like a, a passion play or a church will do a big Christmas spectacular or, you know, all of these kinds of things that churches will do. That's not the regulative principle, people. That's the normative principle because they're like, well, we can do all this. We can do, what is it? Pioneer, it's not Pioneer Drive. I think it's Wiley Baptist. One of them does the living Christmas tree. That's not the regulative principle, people. We're not commanded to do the living Christmas tree. That's the normative principle because they're like, well, nothing condemns it. 
or you do a little play where you bring the kids up there and you got two kids, you know, oh, look at them. Look, you know, one's playing Mary, the other one's playing Joseph, and they got a little baby. Oh, isn't that so cute? Doing the little Christmas story. Uh, that's the normative principle at work. Okay, that's the normative. So they're doing some little, they did some big production and they have the three wise men. I got a picture of them on, on stage. And there's uh, the middle middle wise men. Well, uh, it's not a man, man. It's it's a woman, all right? Um, and you're kind of like, well, wait a minute. Is, is that right or is that wrong? Is that wrong? Now, the article is gonna condemn it. This is what it says. In a Christmas production, um, Hillsong, Australia, depicted one of the wise men as a woman. Now, this is what the article says. This feminiz- feminization of the wise men fits Hillsong's passion to conform Christ to modern culture in direct disobedience to God's word. And Hillsong represents the heart and soul of contemporary worship music. It is a Christianity that is very much at home in the world. All right. So the article condemns it. But wait a minute. Can you condemn that? You say, wait a minute, the Bible clearly, clearly would not have a woman as one of the wise men. Okay, but does the Bible condemn depicting a wise man as a woman? I mean, she's just playing the part, right? She's playing the part. And and, and ancient uh, theater, uh, the, the men would uh, you know play the character as, as a woman because the women wouldn't be allowed. So, so is that okay to do in the church to change it? When you have little kids, sometimes in a, a church will put on some kind of production are, are, are those stories always 100% accurate to the Bible? Do we change little things up, right? Like they'll, you'll have a little Christmas production. You'll have a little Christmas production, right? And here's the kids and maybe you'll have them acting like Mary and Joseph and a little baby. And then some kid will sing happy birthday, Jesus. Wait, do, do, is there ever the, in Bible, is there ever anyone singing happy birthday, Jesus? No, there isn't. So the regulative principle will be like, no, 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 no. We're not going to have any, we're not going to have any passion play. We're not going to have a Christmas pageant. We're not having the living Christmas tree. None of that is told. That's not, nowhere do we find that in the New Testament telling the church to do that. The normative principle is like, come on, we're, we're, we're not condemned. There's nothing condemning this, so we can do it. Well, then how far do you go? How far can you go? How far do you take it? Now, see, some are are normative until up to a point. They're normative, and then they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Now you went too far. Now you went too far. Well, wait, who's to say you went too far? For example, you've had some modern-day churches who've started their worship services with Hell's Bells by ACDC. Some people are like, you can't do that. You, you, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's, you can't do that. If, if a church in Abilene today, you know, or whenever they, they start back, June 1st, whenever they start back, and they decide to start their, uh, their service with, uh, you know, a, a song from the, the newest Justin Bieber album. Is that okay? The Bible doesn't condemn it. And some people are like, that's going absolutely too far. But they have no problem with the living Christmas tree. Regulative or normative, right? Th- these are very important issues uh, to consider, all right? We're going to run out of time in this hour, but that's okay. This is important, all right? So there's, there's a news story right there about Hillsong and that just giving you an example of, is that right or is that wrong? Some people will say that's wrong. Some people will just absolutely, I cannot believe they put a woman as one of the wise men. This is insane. Uh, they're destroying the church. The, you know, uh, feminism is taking over. But then they'll have a, that same church, those same Christians will then have a little Christmas play. And you're like, uh, there's a problem there. There's a pro- That's not the way it went. In fact, many churches will have a Christmas play where you have the wise men showing up at the manger, which is not the way it's supposed to work. Now, I, whenever that would happen, I would get upset and get irritated and want to go grab the wise men, you know, grab the three kids and say, no, go stand in the parking lot and wait a couple of weeks. And then when the kid's in his house, you can sh- you can show up, all right? And they'll be like, no, that's, you know, you're being mean and you're just being, you're being, you know, you're being crazy. Well, am I? Because uh, shouldn't you try to demonstrate the story biblically? Oh, but I'm speaking from the regulative side. The normative side is like, well, the Bible doesn't condemn how it we show the story. Does it or doesn't it? 
But see, some people would, would have no problem with the kids demonstrating the story in an inaccurate way. Because it's a bunch of little kids and it's cute. And so, you know, you should give a, you, you should cut them a little slack. Well, if I'm going to cut them a little slack, then I can cut Hillsong some slack for having a woman as one of the wives. Why not have, well, you know, uh, some of the churches, Pioneer Drive, they usually do their big, like, um, passion play they used to do. So what if they want uh, a woman to play the part of Jesus? Is that okay? So they're like, absolutely not. That's ungodly and blasphemous. Well, you don't have any problem with kids completely messing up the story because it's cute. You've got to be consistent with which principle you're holding to. You've got to be consistent, all right? Just please note, many, and I want to make sure you get this, many liturgical churches, Catholic, Episcopalian, Orthodox, they appear to follow the regulative principle. They also include many elements not found anywhere in Scripture. In fact, many of their elements would actually be going back to, to the, the worship. Uh, you know, they're trying to borrow from the Old Testament worship with the priest and the tabernacle and a lot of the things. They're trying to kind of follow that model. Is that the model you're supposed to follow? Right? These are important questions to have. Let me, let me give you an example. When I was at basic training, basic training, um, I was like, okay, I got to go. I, whenever I can go to church, I'm going to go to church. And the first time I went, they took me to the uh, Protestant, I think it was called General Protestant. I don't know what that thing was, but it was the General Pro- Protestant thing. And I went, oh my goodness. It was, I, I, I lightning should have struck like 150 times and everyone should have died in that service, including me for being in it. But I didn't know any better. And it was, it was insane. It was the normative principle on crack. I mean, they, I don't even know what that was. It was an absolute joke. It was embarrassing. Uh, the chaplains who were in charge of that should all be fired. It was crazy. And so after that, I was like, please, uh, please let me not have to go to that. So I went and said, please, I'm, I need to go to the Lutheran chapel, I, wherever the Lutheran chapel service is, get me as far away from this nonsense as possible. And I went into the Lutheran one and it was like, oh, actual church service. It was actual church service. It was quiet. There were hymns. There was the reading of scripture. There was the homily, the sermon. I was like, oh, church it's an amazing. And there was like six of us there. Okay. There was like six people there, but it was church. It wasn't that insanity that was happening in the Protestant general. But the, the difference is the, the Lutheran one was what you would argue was more regulative in nature. Now, so they're, they're using a liturgical uh, structure. Now, is that liturgy found in the Bible? So maybe in some ways they were violating the regulative, but it was more regulative than the insane insanity that was happening in the general Protestant one, which was a circus that was crazy. There's, again, the difference wasn't in, both would argue they believed the Bible. The difference was in that structure, okay? So very important that we, 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 we follow that. Now let's continue this idea. Uh, the presence, now listen, the presence of formality, the presence of formality and repetition does not necessarily mean a service is regulative. Just as the presence of a more relaxed atmosphere does not indicate a normative approach. I want everyone to write that down. The presence of formality and repetition does not necessarily mean a service is regulative. Just as the presence of a more relaxed atmosphere does not indicate a normative approach. Often tradition gives the appearance of biblical truth when in reality, it just seems right because it is familiar. But formalism is not synonymous with biblical fidelity. I'm going to read all of that again. All right, this is very important. The presence of formality and repetition does not necessarily mean a service is regulative. Just as the presence of a more relaxed atmosphere does not indicate a normative approach. Often, 
tradition gives the appearance of biblical truth. When in reality, it just seems right because it is familiar. But formalism is not synonymous with biblical fidelity. All right? You could walk into a church that's very formal, very structured, and you may say, oh, okay, there's the regulative principle. Look at that. But what just be, that doesn't mean it's following the regulative principle. It can be following a tradition. And because it feels familiar, you're like, that's the right way. But that doesn't mean that. And you can find something else that seems far more relaxed, far more relaxed and, and, and laid back. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's the normative. That doesn't mean that. All right. You've got to learn to think this through. For example, some, some, uh, some, some people, if they come into a church and, uh, for example, I'm not wearing a tie. They're like, oh, that's, you know, they're, they're that far normative, you know, seeker sensitive craziness because he doesn't wear a tie. Okay, well, come on. D- does the scripture tell me I have to, does the, te- the scripture tell me I have to wear a tie? Am I commanded? Is, is the dress of the pastor ever addressed in scripture? Is, is there a certain dress that is condemned in scripture? Is there a certain address, a certain dress that is commanded in scripture? Well, the best you would have, you'd have to go back to the Old Testament to the priest and the robes and everything they wore. Well, some people believe that that regulates what the, that what a pastor should wear. Well, okay, then I should be wearing robes. It has nothing to do with a tie, but some have made the tie part of the regulative principle. And if you don't have a tie, they're not going to that church because you're seeker sensitive. Having a pulpit, right? Now, some will say, well, in Nehemiah, it talks about a pulpit, okay? So is that the way it should, if you don't have a pulpit, some will say, "Uh uh-oh, no pulpit. That's seeker sensitive. That's that normative nonsense, seeker sensitive garbage. Not gonna have anything to do with it. Well, what is, does the Bible and the New Testament ever articulate what the church uh, architecture should look like? Does it? Some will say, well, you better preach this way. You've got a specific way you have to preach. And if you don't preach that way, then, then you're not, I mean, you'll, you'll definitely hear this in the reform world. You'll definitely hear this in the reform world. If you preach a certain sermon and you don't really, quote unquote, preach Jesus and him crucified, died, and buried, they'll say that's not New Testament preaching and you're not preaching and that preaching is condemned. You're like, whoa, does the New Testament really outline exactly how I'm supposed to preach? Does it outline? Does it now? It, it, it obviously it commands that when when you teach, you teach the word correctly. But does it outline exactly what it looks like? The reform people say it does, says it does. The normative's like, wait a minute, I, I, I'm not. I can I can do any. I can do my preaching can go any way I want it to go as long as I don't violate what is clearly condemned. So what? How does this work? Sometimes we make something regulative that's not regulative, that's not even a part of, we we create our own regulations. In fact, we go beyond the Bible and we create our own. How um, the church should do this, and if this happens, this is what everyone should do. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does the Bible outline what we're to do in every situation? Now, some people who hold to the regulative principle will come up with all kinds of rules and regulations, and you're like, "Where, where does the scripture tell you to do that? What, what, what does it tell you if A happens, you do B, C, D, E? No, it doesn't. All right. So what, what can you do? What, what, what's allowed? What's not allowed? That, that This raises lots of questions. Now, we didn't even get to the podcast yet, but the reason is we can't get to the podcast until we really have this principle down. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to stop now. If you have any questions about the regulative or normative principle, any questions at all, any confusion at all, please Indicate that in the chat immediately. And then if we need to, we will address that at the beginning of the next hour. But we really need to have this down, regulative and normative. Because again, this deals not only with the church, but in your Christian life. You can be living your Christian life in a very regulative way. Hey, I can only do in my life what is clearly outlined in Scripture. Okay, Others are like normative. Man, I can do anything I want as long as I don't sin. Now, trust me. Two different Christians with those two different philosophies rarely are going to agree on anything. They're not going to agree on how church is going to be done. They're not going to agree on how to live the Christian life. They're not going to agree on, they're going to agree on very little, all right? And this is why we have to figure out which one is right. But let me state it again. 
These are, I believe these are presuppositions that are placed upon the text. I don't know if the text, I don't know if you read from Genesis to Revelation, you are told, hold to the regulative and hold to the normative. All right. We'll look at two. Uh, we'll start the next hour looking at two biblical passages that I want to look at, and uh, we'll talk about this some more. There's there's a lot here to unpack, uh, and then we'll get to this. Uh, I, my notes. I don't even know if I look at my notes here. I've got I don't know eight more paragraphs of notes. Uh, so obviously I'm not going to be able to get to all my notes on this subject. But I think I've outlined what the two principles are, and then you can ask your questions. We'll come back, we'll look at two passages of Scripture, and then we'll jump into this podcast and analyze it, all right? So there you go. We'll be back here shortly. Ask the questions, thoughts, questions. Please, please, please share them in the chat because that will kind of give me a direction uh, to go in the next hour uh, before we jump right into the podcast. All right. Hopefully hopefully you benefited from this. Hopefully, hopefully. All right. And if, if you didn't know anything about this prior to this discussion, indicate that. Now, Members of Victory Baptist Church, you better not tell me you've never heard of this because we've talked about the regulative principle countless times, especially when it comes to the Lord's Supper. You talk about following the regulative principle. We are very much the regulative principle when it comes to the Lord's Supper. We are very, well, well, you could argue in some ways we violate the regulative principle. We could talk about that, but we've talked about the regulative principle as, as, as far as a lot of issues in the church. So, you should have already known it. If you didn't, if you say you didn't, then you weren't paying attention and just don't tell me because then I'll just, you know, I'll just give up and I'll crawl in the floor and just cry for the next hour. Okay, there you go. All right. Share your feedback. All right. Let's, uh, let's pray. Uh, let's, let's do pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning, Lord. The one thing we want to do as Christians is to follow you correctly. The one thing we want to do as Christians is for the church to operate correctly. Uh, Throughout church history, principles have been given. Which principle is correct? Which principle is wrong? Nobody has ever agreed on it in church history. Lord, I pray that we would consider these principles carefully. We would consider the scriptures carefully. And uh, you would just uh, give us the wisdom to try to understand the correct way to move forward. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm